you are at uh, West Orlando WordPress. We have a link at the bottom there. You can just type that into your computer if you want to follow along. Um, follow some of these slides as we go. Um, and then we will also post the slides online on the meetup and, um, probably on, and also the video will be on Facebook. So you'll be able to access all of this later. But uh, if you want to take notes, you want to you know, follow along on your computer, that's fine. So today we have with us, we're privileged to have with us uh, Matthew Montoya. He's a channel enablement and marketing manager for Constant Contact. Um, as, we, as he and I were talking, uh, he's been a public speaker for about 750,000 miles? 750, wow, 750,000 miles doing this stuff. And this was the first venue that he's had to go to where he could just walk to it because he lives right around here. So <laughs> this is great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is the topic of, his dis of the discussion today, get more marketing email opens with great subject lines. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Matthew. First, thanks for having me. Thanks, Hope. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Thank um, like it was said uh, to, to you at the, at the restaurant, Rob just said, um, I literally live in this apartment complex, so <laughs> yay for me. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for having me. So I've challenged a little bit, so first off I'll just say with my title and you saw what company I work for, uh, I don't want you to have any um, preconceptions of what I'm going to do. Everything I'm going to teach you and talk to you about today is product agnostic. Uh, I'm going to treat email marketing as email marketing as email marketing. Um, I, I am going to, for the most part, not mention constant contact other than in my biography. Um, I am a little challenged. Um, I did spend uh, about half a year at Bluehost, which is a common sponsor for uh, uh, WordCamps. And it's through that relationship when I worked with Bluehost that I got to know the WordPress community and the community at large. Um, but now I am back at Constant Contact. Um, actually, before I go into that. So I, I, the challenge is, um, while I have done some web dev work in, in WordPress, I am by no means a web developer, um, and in fact, my site you would probably laugh at. Um, but it is Disney related, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, gotta work your market, right? Um, that said, uh, I was challenged because what am I going to talk about to you? Uh, and I, I feel like subject lines actually are really good subject matter because it's something that I think, and actually, most people are challenged with if they're doing email marketing in some sort uh, for their either their organization or if you have clients, subject lines can be a challenge. Um, and so I thought that's probably going to be the, the subject matter that would help you the most today. Uh, so we'll start off with a question. What is it that gets bulk email marketing opened? Uh, what is it that actually motivates people to open an email? Sales. Call to attention. But when it hits their inbox, what makes them open it? I know, right? You thought I was throwing you a, a trick question. I am throwing you a, twi a trick question. <laughs> it is not the subject line, and that's a popular misconception. Um, so really, the high level first lesson, and the number one lesson I'd want you to walk away from if you're doing this for your uh, WordPress site or for clients, is the subject line is often thought of as the reason an email is opened. It is not. It's who the sender is. Um, and small business in particular overlook that. Um, so first, just to define email marketing, email marketing is a permission-based uh, uh, email marketing or a permission-based marketing solution. Permission being that they gave somebody their email address at some part of a sales process, some part of a visit process. These aren't strangers, and because they're not strangers, um, and we can talk offline if you want about the legality of of why you want to use a bulk email marketing solution. Um, but because of that relationship, most people look at the sender's name as what will push them to open an email. And so high level first lesson is if you're going to do, well actually let me just ask a question. How many of you are currently undertaking email marketing in some sort? Okay, I, I figured just with my title and the title of this content, you'd probably be raising your hand. Um, so it, it, you, when you're thinking about the sender's name, you want to make sure that you're choosing a sender's name that's recognizable to the audience. And just uh, I'll do a little more biography in a second, but I have taught over 14,000 small businesses in my 10 years at Constant Contact. And some 
use their name as the sender's name. It's just what they're used to doing. You don't want to do that if your audience doesn't know you personally. If you're not the brand, then you want to have the email come from the brand. Um, so most people, if you think about your own behavior, if you're pulling out your phone, you're looking at your inbox, you're probably not going subject line to subject line to subject line. You're probably looking at who sent me this. And this is where the relationship matters. Because if you know that person, or if you know that organization, you slow down and then you look at the subject line. But it's not even then that you're looking at the subject line. What we've discovered is people are actually more and more often reading this little bit of text. Everybody see that little bit of gray text? Now that's called the pre-header text. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But uh, let's go ahead and cover what I'll cover this, this evening. So we're going to talk about the basics of a good subject line. Then we'll talk about trends in writing great subject lines. And then lastly, we'll talk about tips to get more creative with your subject line. My name is Matthew Matoy. I think we've done enough biography. Um, that is my Twitter handle if you want to follow me. And I'll share my LinkedIn handle at the, at the end. And these, this deck is available, Rob, at that link you showed earlier? Okay. So let's start with the basics of a good subject line. So most, this is not a surprise, I think this is uh, preaching to the choir in this, this kind of audience. Um, most emails are open on a phone. Uh, we'll do a little interactive piece. How many of you checked your email today on your phone? How many of you checked your email today on your phone within probably the last 30 minutes? Extremely common. Uh, for most small businesses and nonprofits, over 51% of their list opens an email on a phone. Um, so we have to think about this little bit of real estate. Now we certainly, if I was doing an email design session with you, we'd absolutely think about this little, uh, little piece of real estate. But when it comes to an inbox, this is a very fast transaction. We're talking milliseconds that people are scrolling through their inbox. Um, and so that's why that familiarity is so important because when people are scrolling through on this device and they're spending so little time, that name recognition is really important. So if you're gonna do email marketing or if you're coaching a client to do email marketing, you wanna make sure that that name is extremely recognizable. Then most people scan through and they'll read that little pre-header text. We'll get into pre-header text a little bit more in just a second. But we need to make sure that everything is short and concise and sweet because people are gonna spend so little time with it. So how long should this, and actually I wanna break down pre-header text just a little bit more at this point. <laughs> so most email clients, content contact, other tools you may use, uh, will give you the ability to edit the pre-header text. Now if you didn't know what pre-header text is or you weren't using a tool that employs edit editability, then generally it's gonna be the first sentence of your email. Now the reason why this is important in a marketing context is because often that first sentence of an email isn't enough to push people to open an email itself. But because tools will allow you, like Constant Contact, will allow you to edit that, you can use that little bit of text in the pre-header to push people over the edge to open the email. If you want to think about your own behavior, if you get an email on your smartphone, you're looking through, oh, my coworker sent me an email. And what you're likely doing is reading the little bit of text that's coming from the first sentence of the email to give you context. Is this on fire or not? Should I open this now or wait till later or just ignore it? So the reason why this is important in a marketing perspective is because, because you can edit this pre-header text, because it often drives opens, it's very wise to employ some marketing creativity in editing that pre-header text. Does that make sense? All right. So let's break down subject line best practices. So ultimately, if we think about the inbox and we think about a subject line, the subject line is actually the third reason somebody opens an email. But that's upside down from what most people think. The reality of subject lines is subject line really, its main purpose is to look different. If you're trying to get more opens to motivate people to go to your site, if you're trying to get more opens to sell something, if you're trying to get more opens for a client, it's ultimately how the subject line looks as much as how it reads. And that's because of the limited nature of, of time, the limited amount of time people are spending in an inbox. They're zipping through that inbox really quickly. and Anything that looks a little different that catches their eye is going to slow them down. That when they slow down, now they're thinking through who sent me this, what's the value proposition, is this worth my time? But we do need to keep a subject line short. Subject line needs to be about four to seven words. That's because most clients will actually cut off the rest of the subject line. And honestly, if you haven't made your point within four to seven words, you're likely losing your audience anyway. Pre-header text, you have a little bit more wiggle room, about five to eight words. So in practice, 
when you're writing, and I'm going to show you a lot of preheader text and subject lines today. In practice, if you're going to write preheader text, it's wise to either have the preheader text support your subject line, because it's additional room to explain what your email is about, or to tease people to open the email. And you're going to see examples of both of those. Pause here, see if you have any questions. The first two words are the key words. That's going to be what the eye notices first. So let's talk about, I'm going to talk about some more don'ts, but let's just kind of talk about very common things people do when they're doing email marketing. The first is don't waste people's time. I see this so, common, uh, so commonly, this first bullet point, where people will write their email and they'll have their company name in the subject line. This month's newsletter from Matco. Well, you don't want to do that. One, you're wasting precious space and time. And if you follow the best practice and your email's coming from a recognizable name, odds are that recognizable name is your company name. So you're basically repeating your name in uh, a, a tiny little amount of space and not encouraging people to open the email. This one is done to death, and this is probably the one I would encourage people to rethink the most. Matco November newsletter. I see it all the time. The problem with that is, one, I already discussed repeating your name. It's already there, so there's no need to repeat it. But two, the word newsletter. If you're writing a newsletter for your audience, don't use the word newsletter. It's OK to call it a newsletter on your website. It's OK to call it a just join our newsletter. It's OK to call it internally in the actual email itself, but don't use the word newsletter in a subject line. The reason for that, I'll actually pull you. When I say newsletter, what comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> Point made. Point made, I can just walk on home. Um, the, word, the word newsletter denotes boring, long, complex. Now, I didn't want to go too deep at all into email construction, but just kind of high level. Successful email marketing, if you're going to actually write a marketing email, shortness really matters. It needs to be really short. It needs to, as best you can, fit on the screen on a mobile device without people scrolling. Because when it comes to marketing emails, very few people are going to scroll more than maybe two or three scrolls. Um, so the fact that newsletter elicits a <laughs> you're basically saying, hey, you got an hour and a half to read a really long email? <laughs> people are going to say no, right? So avoid the word newsletter. But I also often see. An example where they're using newsletter, their company name, and another poison word, which is the month we're in. So Matco November newsletter. See it all the time. We've already talked about newsletter. We've already talked about my company name in the subject line. But then why are you wasting precious time here in this short attention span world we live in, where you're trying to motivate somebody to open an email? Why are you telling them the month we're in? You don't have to tell them it's November. They know it's November. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could depend audience to audience. Um, but, but honestly, ideally, they know it's November. Um, also, avoid repeating yourself. And I see, this, um, I see this also commonly. And this is, I think, just a case of people being creative, creatively fatigued. They repeat the same subject line every week. And I often hear, or every month, it's, I often hear, well, my audience is used to it. And I say, well, how'd you test that out? You do a split test, what was your logic, and, and knowing that that's the best subject line. Mm. So we'll talk about testing a little bit later as well, but I think that this is probably uh, preaching to the choir. You test your website, also test your email marketing. Uh, do split tests, do a, do a uh, really popular in email marketing would be a, a 25, 25, 50 split um, to get the best kind of results for your subject line. What's a 25, 25? All right, uh, 25, 25, 25, uh, 25, 25, 50 split. So the way you run it, um, some tools do it automatically. Uh, I can't speak to all the, all the tools out there. But 25, 25, 50 split is 25% of your list gets one subject line. 25% of your list gets the other. You wait however many days you think is going to give you the best results. More days will give you the best results. And then send 50%. The remaining 50%, whichever subject line performed best, meaning that 75% of your list gets the best subject line you can come up with. Um, not very common that small businesses and nonprofits test their subject lines, much less their content. And so, going out to, uh, to the audience that I talk to is don't take my word for it as I share examples for you. Don't
don't take my word for it, but don't take your word for it either. If you're going to take email marketing, test your audience, test your audience, test your audience. It's the only way to come up with the best solution. Great question. Any other questions? All right. Um, we want to give them reasons to open the email. So let's talk about the, uh, a little more creativity. Humor. There are some audiences you may not want to use humor, but for the most part, humor always works. Um, calm down, Mother Nature. If that's playing to a place that gets a lot of snow, Syracuse. Um, I, I moved down four years ago from Massachusetts, so I, uh, it snowed two days ago, and I had a hearty laugh. Um, <laughs> um, so if you can use humor and it works with your audience, humor will generally uh, get an audience to open an email because it's eye-catching, because people like to laugh. Use numbers. Um, I'm going to actually go deeper into this a little bit later, but numbers. If there was one subject line I probably used too much, and one subject line I've seen repeatedly win in a split test, it's a numbered list. It's sometimes I, I get audiences tell me, well, isn't that overplayed? Isn't that used too much on other sites? Yeah. I'm going to death. You know why? It works. It really does. And if we break down this subject line, five tips for a perfectly grilled rib, if that's interesting to the audience, that's actually inferring something really important. The average email subscriber only spends about 11.7 .7 seconds with an email, with a marketing email. So by giving people a numbered list, we're telling them that it's finite. Here's something you want, and here's a little bit, about, here's a little bit of time to achieve what you want to do. That's why numbered lists with subject lines work so well. Be uh, inquisitive. Are your investments working for you? Showing an interest in your audience, especially with the word you or your, is really powerful. Um, if I'm subscribed to this, I'm probably investing with them. That's going to pique my interest and move me forward. Pull at their heartstrings. Anybody working for nonprofits, working with nonprofits? All right. It's a little, um, it might seem a little, uh, 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 Obvious, but nonprofits generally pull at the heartstrings, and if an audience is being asked to donate or take action for a nonprofit, it kind of works. Um, take five minutes to help animals, and then FOMO, fear of missing out, another really powerful solution for subject lines. Last minute, it can drive people if it's to do something they want to do. So, um, before I go into welcome email subject lines, we'll talk a little bit about the welcome email itself. So many email marketing solutions, whatever one you use, offer the ability to do automation and offer the ability to automate your welcome email. Um, a welcome email is triggered when somebody joins your list or you add somebody to a list. Whatever way you do that, whether that's from your site and from a, um, from a subscriber list or whether you're doing business, e-commerce, or whatever. However they get on your list, an email is automatically triggered when they join your list. The reason why welcome emails are so important and enough for me to slow down and talk about is because welcome email has the highest open rate generally of any marketing email you'll ever send out, about 80%. True is that if you're trying to motivate people to do something, anything, odds are they're going to do it from that welcome email. The reason is if I just went to your site and I just signed up for your marketing list, if I just did business with you, or I just called in, or however I, you're, you got my email address, it likely just occurred. So if you send me an email almost immediately, possibly be. This is particularly important in a sales context because if they're showing an interest in you, and they immediately get an email from you, and you're in a sales position, what would you offer them in that welcome email? some kind of discount, some kind of offer. Whatever's going to push in that little bit extra to, to convert them. And so if you're not, if you are doing email marketing and you're not employing a welcome email, make sure you look into the product you're using and see if they have automated triggers for you. Within welcome emails, and to fit the point that we just made hope, a thank you for our subscribers. 25% off, this is the pre-header, this is that little bit of text that appears underneath the subject line. 25% off, uh, one full price REI co-op brand item. So these are real subject lines. Um, Distinctive Landscaping says, enjoy your coupon. We can't wait to see you. So again, I don't want to get too off topic on subject lines, but if you're trying to solicit people for email addresses, 
and this is true no matter what category of site you have, no matter what your business angle is, most people do not want to and most likely won't join a mailing list. Unfortunately, what's most common on websites or on WordPress sites is join my, way, my mailing list. Asking people to join a mailing list is basically a way of dissuading them from joining a mailing list. <laughs> Better thing to do if you're in a, in a sales-oriented business um, or you're coaching sales-oriented businesses is to create an offer. Get 25% off your first order. They go to that, 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 that pop-up or that page. They put in their information to get the offer. It triggers a welcome email. They're almost guaranteed to open it. They're almost guaranteed to convert and do whatever you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Aren't we smart enough to know if that's it's just a bait the switch? Yeah, <laughs> we are. Um, well, first well, let me let me define. Most I, people don't fall. Most people fall for it anyway. Um, when you change the verbiage from join my mailing list to something that is more sales oriented, you can expect to see something like 280 percent higher subscription rate. Um, one thing that, to be clear, and, and I, I, this is pushing a little more towards website and pushing a little more towards website creation, you want to make sure you set the expectations for your subscribers. So on that, on that page of your site or in your pop-up, you'd say, get 25% off and then tell them the cadence of emails they can expect and or tell them what kind of emails they can expect. That way it's not so much a bait and switch. Um, you could even do that in your welcome email. So you say, here's your 25% discount. You're now also on our mailing list. You can expect to see an email from us every month where we'll share tips, advice, and other discounts. Um, that way it's not so beach, <laughs> bait and switchy. Um, but as long as you're clear with people that the expectation is they are joining a list, um, it can, right, it can I'm really... I'm specifically for the ones that don't call it out. No, the best practice, and I'm glad you called me out on that, because the best practice would be to be upfront with your subscribers. Don't just offer them 25% off. Let them understand that they're getting on the list. I'm surprised at how many <clears throat> don't, at least in what I view. Yeah. How many people don't? Now, how many, um, the offer, it could be for the top 10 leadership things instead of a coupon. It's oh, knowledge. absolutely. I mean, it doesn't have to be a sale. I mean, in fact, I would only probably push a sale highly in retail. Um, I, it's a very good motivator for retail, but if you're not in retail, if a B2B, for instance, a business to business, knowledge is a fantastic way to convert uh, people to joining your list. You, you know, join our mailing list or sign up here to get our top 10 ideas on X. Um, and then when they do that, submit the top 10 things through your welcome email. Any other questions, comments? All right. Um, if you haven't considered it, another smart piece of automation is a birthday and or anniversary trigger. Not necessarily a happy anniversary, a happy wedding anniversary, but a happy you've done business with us a year anniversary type anniversary email. And for subject lines, I think it's pretty obvious. Happy birthday. We are going to talk a little bit more about personalization, but personalization is a very powerful way to increase your open rates. Um, your membership runs out on 2-7, renew today. And we'll talk a little bit about preheader. We hope you like the cake. Let's celebrate. Keep making progress towards your fitness goals. Offers and promotions. Celebrate National Oyster Day beginning August 4th. Um, email exclusive. Blueberry pricing or blueberry picking starts on Sunday. If you can include that fear of missing out, which is what this is, it's a powerful motivator. If I'm already invested in this organization in some way, that's going to push me over the edge. These two words are also really powerful words, and uh, they're really powerful words to use on your site in your email marketing solicitation and in your email, if you make people feel like they are part of an exclusive group, and honestly, you should treat them as such, they're more likely to open future emails. We'll talk a little bit about relevancy here. The secret, I mean, there's many secret ingredients to getting people to open marketing emails and acting on them. But one of the most important is making your email content, and I would say your web content too, as relevant to your audience as possible. Relevancy really matters in email marketing because people spend so little time in a marketing email. Um, extra points if you remember how long people spend in a marketing email? 11.7 seconds. Um, <clears throat> and so the more relevant it is, the more sticky they're going to be within the email and the more likely they're going to take action. And so one way you can keep your email audience engaged and considering your email marketing relevant is to make them feel exclusive. Give them something they can't find anywhere else. 
and they're more likely to open future emails. If you can include that exclusive, exclusive feeling, if you can make them feel like they're part of a club in your subject line, you might increase your opens. Event emails, fear of missing out works really well here. Oh my, o OMG, last chance to save on Connects tickets. Hello. Um, this falls more into B2Bs um, and uh, 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 nonprofits, but it could also work with a for profit. Um, if there's one thing that I consistently have to preach to all categories of businesses and nonprofits is, and this might sound as a surprise since I led so much with discounts and sale talk at the beginning of my talk today, um, is don't make email marketing all sales. It's a quick way to turn your audience off. And the reason for that, even if they join to get a discount, the reason for that is relevancy. Um, if your email marketing hits their inbox at a time that they don't need you, because there's only a few categories of business that people need all the time. If they don't need you right then or they're not in the position to donate or to take whatever action it is that you're asking them to take action, then it's immediately an irrelevant email. You know, I may love, um, oh, I'll use a local, a local story. Um, I, I love, I actually get my hair cut across the street, the barbershop across the street. They may send me an offer, but if I had recently gotten my hair cut or for whatever reason I'm out of town, I travel frequently, just by the nature that I don't need their service right now, that discount is irrelevant. If you consistently teach your audience that an email is irrelevant, they start to tune you out. A lot of small businesses and nonprofits that I talk to fear unsubscribes, people that leave their list. They should fear the people that just ignore emails. Because I'd be willing to bet in your inbox right now are emails from organizations that you've bought from, tier four, that you ignore. And you most likely ignore them, not because you dislike them, but because at some point they taught you that their marketing is irrelevant, right? It just becomes white noise, you skip by it. So, you want to as often as you can in your content, but also suggest in your subject line, not only exclusive content, but literally education. Education is a powerful way to get people to open an email regularly. Giving people knowledge that your organization or the organization you're coaching can't get anywhere else. And so that's what's happening here. It's a new white paper, Explore the ROI for Peer-to-Peer. -peer. Eight healthy whole foods, there's that number list again. Eight healthy whole foods that could uh, slow weight loss. <laughs> this is actually one I submitted. Um, I, I use this app and I open that email. Why? Well, if I use that app, what's that, what's that, what does that company name suggest I'm trying to do? Weight. Right? Exactly. So, if I'm trying, I'm trying to do both, and here I am drinking a beer with you. Um, I'm trying to do both, right? Um, so if I get this email from an app I, I subscribe to, and it's giving me something I want, what, what am I most likely to do with that? But it's not telling me 25% off my next order of more, right? Nonprofits, pulling at the heartstring a little bit. Again, a little bit of personalization too. Thank you for adopting Shay from Gifford. What does that subject line suggest? <clears throat> Not abstractly, like literally. Is there a relationship there? There's a relationship there, and it's a relationship this organization is paying attention to because what would have had just had to have occurred to this for the subject line to be oh, okay. right. So that falls into personalization. Personalization is one of the cornerstones to good email marketing. Honestly, good marketing period in this day and age but it's also a keystone to your subject line. So the more information you can collect from your potential subscribers, the better. You don't want to seem creepy, but certainly first name, last name, company name, things that you think will be helpful to you to make decisions, that's going to be really important. And that's going to be really important in two ways. One, probably preaching to the choir, segmentation is really important in email marketing as it is in so many other ways. Um, so sending like-minded, like location-based people, like um, uh, interest groups, content that's relevant to them is going to equal more success. Um, the more you can know about your subscribers, the more unique content you can give them, the more likely they're going to uh, open future emails. And that's what this subject line suggests. Um, blessing, f uh, blessing of food and kindness, pulling at the heartstrings. What you don't want to do with subject lines is be misleading. Don't lie to people. And the way that I most commonly see people doing that, even innocently, 
I guarantee you've gotten emails like this in your life. Um, implying a continuing, uh, continuing conversation uh, using the RE or the FWD. Yes, you might increase your open rates, but you're going to also increase people marking you as spam, and it's not going to convert for you. So you don't want to use those tricks. Don't imply unneeded urgency. So the fear of missing out is powerful, but don't imply that they've got to take action right now to get that 25% off, right? We don't, want, we, don't want to, we don't want to trick people. This falls into bait and switch. And don't be deceptive about their actions. So this is spam behavior 101. Um, I cannot tell you how many Apple or, or Amazon emails I get that tell me my order was fouled up and I didn't order anything, right? Um, that is classic spam behavior. Common triggers for spam filters. So this is the automated spam filter in inbox. Spammy words. If you saw it in a spam, you likely don't want to use that in your subject line. And that includes the word free. Now, it does, the word free does differ from inbox to inbox and in the algorithms that choose whether to deliver an email to the inbox or deliver it to the spam filter. But if there's one poison word I'd avoid in a subject line, it's free. Because many times it's going to end up in the spam filter. But what does, what does free denote to you? No, no. Cheap. No value. No value. Right? You can undervalue your product, your good, or your service if you use the word free, especially in your subject line. No cost, low cost, that's a, a great alternative. You want to watch out for the word free. Guarantee, spam, weight loss, mortgage, savings. Those are all words we'd see in a spam. You want to use, avoid that in your subject line. You want to avoid writing in all caps. Um, spammers write in all caps. You don't want to do what spammers do. Spammers and my mom use all caps. They both need to stop. <laughs> My mom's screaming at me all the time. <laughs> Matt, we're coming for Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Excessive punctuation. So you can use multiple pieces of punctuation in a subject line, but you don't want to use them in a row. Triple question mark, triple explanation point. Um, one very common thing I see a lot of people do is use ellipses. They use ellipses to shorten their subject line. That's three periods, and your email may end up in the spam filter. Mm. Remember, spam filters are robots. So you also want to think very critically about literally what you're saying. You want to put a, a to the subject line you wrote. Now, this is going to get a little bluish, but this is an actual subject line. What's wrong with the subject line? Why would the spam filter not like it? Why did this e email end up in the spam folder? Uh, last longer. Last longer, <laughs> right? That is a word, a combination of words you would see in a spam. Well, guess what? The spam filter isn't smart enough for context. It doesn't know that this is HVAC company. It just sees those combinations of words, throws in the spam filter. So you want to put a real critical eye to what you're saying in your, in your subject line. A little better model of that would be regular maintenance is key to a healthy system. Next, we're going to talk about some trends. How am I doing on time, Rob? You are at 6.42. And Can I ask about... Uh, Emojis and spam filters? I'm just going to do that. Because you don't have any in your screen. It's chat. coming. Okay. It's coming. You're it's coming. Time. Okay. We're going to get to emojis. Okay. If, I can, if I can pocket that. Um, as I said, you want to try to, if you're going to write a subject line, the two, the first thing I want you to think about when you're writing your subject line is try, can I employ the words you or your in this situation? If you can employ the words you or your, employ the words you or your. Those are really powerful words because now you're putting the ownership of the problem, the solution, the location, whatever it is you're talking about, you're making them think about it personally. As soon as they start to internalize what you're saying, you're more likely to get them to act because now it's their problem. Now it's their potential solution. We're putting it on them. Um, are your Google ads some random company whose company's Google ads are not showing? My Google Ads. You're making me think about myself, and you're making me think about the impact of the organization and myself. Does that make sense? I use their names or other details. We talked about personalization. So if you can collect pers uh, uh, personal information with a degree of respect, then you need to collect it. Because not only will that help you with that uh, segmentation, but it can also help you personalize an email. When you personalize a subject line, it can, cr it, it can increase open rates 44%. Because it's taking this concept and it's literally applying somebody's name to it. Um, there it is. 
All right. So first, go ahead and ask your question about emojis and, and spam filters, and then we'll go into emoji usage. Does it increase spam filters? Spam uh, emails going in spam filters? Is that where you're going to ask? Yeah. I mean, some subject lines are just. And I'm like, right. Don't. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. So much like the rules with, um, with multiple punctuation, you want to limit your emoji usage because spammers have learned to try to get around spam filters by using emojis instead of words. Mm -hmm. So in the spirit of not doing what they do, we suggest no more than two. Okay. And generally, I advise just one. But make sure it's a powerful one. Um, when, I, when I present to general audiences, and I bring up this slide, I usually get a mixed response. Half the audience groans, and half the audience, audience goes, yeah, <laughs> emojis. Um, I was one of the, the latter. I was not a big fan of emojis. I have an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old, both daughters. They mostly talk to me in emojis, mm -hmm. and I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, uh, so I've never been a big fan of emojis until I started using them in my subject lines. If the principle is to make your subject line look different, to stand out, and because you have a limited time with your audience, well, an emoji can speak more words than the actual words. And visually, it looks different. But you don't want to employ it all the time, and you don't want to use too many of them. Um, here's an example of split testing. This is a 20-20-60 split. One has a subject line, uh, one has an emoji, and one doesn't. So this falls under the don't even take popular uh, uh, themes and ideas that are out there in the market. Don't, don't do it just because other people are doing it. Test your audience. You might discover that emojis don't resonate with this audience. I wouldn't do them. Yeah? So is that a tool or something that um, shows you how many people open your email? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, so the way this works is you can actually slide this bar back and forth and determine how much of your audience will get which subject line. And then you can determine how long the test will run, and it will happen automatically. Oh. I cannot speak to all email clients out there. This is in constant contact. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to use, I think this is fairly self-explanatory. You want to convey feelings or emotions or thoughts with your emojis. Um, did someone say free shipping? A uh, picture is worth a $150 gift card. We're telling our audience something with the emoji. Best emo uh, email, uh, emoji best practices. See, this is why you don't get a beer right before you talk. <laughs> Especially at the end of the day. Um, start with a small sample of your list. So, you know, much like what I told you about with my experience with emojis, my personal feelings with emojis, maybe your audience doesn't like emojis. It's not something you want to just go full bore into. So make sure you test your audience. If you don't have a tool that lets you do that, just choose a small sample size of your audience and just have them test it for you. Um, you definitely want to, don't want to use emojis all the time. You definitely don't want to use emojis all the time or you lose their effectiveness, right? That's really true for all the ideas I'm going to be sharing with you. Don't keep going back to the well. It won't work. And you want to make sure that the emoji supports your message. Now, when it comes to emoji, uh, many email clients may have an emoji picker built in. If they don't, a great source for emojis for email marketing, social media marketing, and beyond is emojipedia.org. E-M-O-J-I-P-E-D-I-A dot org. Free, awesome uh, collection of emojis, thousands and thousands of emojis. And it'll show you how they'll render across platforms. So you can be sure that the emoji you choose for your marketing looks good. And because of that, do know emojis will render differently. What's that? Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in his presentation. Okay. Um, brackets are really powerful, especially in business profits. Brackets are a way to focus the eye on the subject matter. Um, so we, we can clearly see not only is this a new webinar, but because it's bracketed, we'll notice it more. And in a busy inbox, that little bit of extra time we spend looking at it might increase our opens. Um, I'll also call out some of the preheader text. Um, so here's an example of bad preheader text. So as a reminder, the preheader text is the little bit of text that appears underneath the subject line. You want to make sure you think this through because some email clients, some email marketing tools you use, instead of giving the first sentence, will give a message like this. Right? Having trouble viewing this email, click here is a really common one. Well, if I am a recipient of a marketing email 
and it says having trouble viewing this email or view in browser, what is that implying? Not so You're not very good at this. <laughs> well, one, <laughs> one. But also, what is this email prim primarily trying to get me to do? Open up a sell, sell me, right? Um, and, and so you, you want to make sure that you change that preheader text. Okay. Lastly, so let's get creative with these. So these are going to be some of the ideas we talked about with some examples, plus some others that I haven't talked to you about. So remember that the key ingredient to successful subject line writing is to make your subject line look different. Right? Now that's specific to the subject line. What's the first thing people will actually read? We talked about it Who earlier. It Who it's from, right? So that is the number one. Um, but making our subject line look different can increase our opens, and alliteration is a powerful way to do that. Alliteration is repeating the same letter for every word of your subject line. Um, six seasonal saving secrets is an example of alliteration. Now the reason why this is really powerful is because of the way the human mind works. So we are hardwired, we can't turn it off, we are hardwired to notice patterns. When we are seeing a lot of data at once, our brain tries to make sense of it by looking for patterns. That happens both when you're behind your computer screen, but it also happens in public in general. Your brain is constantly looking for patterns to make sense of chaos. That's a door, that's a window, that's a light, that's a person, right? Now the reason why we're hardwired to do this is because we were taught at infanthood to recognize a pattern for survival. What pattern was that? Rhyming. Y'all need to call your mom. <laughs> a parent's face. A parent's face equals survival, right? And so the two eyes, the mouth is the first thing our brain taught us to recognize, right? So that's hardwired. It's deep wired into us. This is playing into that concept. In chaos, which is the inbox, if you give people a pattern, if you force a pattern into their eye, they're more likely to notice it. What's the pattern? All those S's, all those S's. Yeah. Top trendy T's to try today, all those T's. This does require some creativity, but if you can pull it off, you'll see your open rate increase because you're playing into human psychology. Any questions? It's interesting. Chunking is also psychological. So chunking is purposefully not writing your subject line as a sentence. Most people purpose, they, they can't help themselves. They write their subject lines as sentences. They, just, they don't even think about not writing it as a sentence. It may not be a perfect sentence, but it's got a very sentence-like structure. There's no rule, there's no spam rule that says you don't have to write, you, don't, you have to write in a subject line. You can purposely not write a, a subject line as a sentence. New tops, new jeans, new outfits. That's not a sentence. But in a world of sentences, the one that's not a sentence gets noticed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You plus us equals more clients for you. Not really a sentence. But because it's not a sentence, it's going to get noticed. Is that why? Because you're trying to correct that? Because it's not a sentence? Um, I think psychologically, well, there's two pieces at play. One is because everything else is in a proper sentence form, it stands out. It just looks different. Um, but I would agree, because we're going to talk about an example like that in a moment, that it irks us in a, in a deep psychological way. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, <OCD> yeah. <laughs> so illusion. Illusion is purposely uh, 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 All right, so a famous movie title, a famous song title, a famous movie quote, whatever you think your audience would understand. Now, if you're going to employ illusion, you've got to make sure, would my audience get it? Right? And this would be something exceptionally good for doing split testing or some sort of testing. But you gotta ask yourself, would your audience get it? Life is like a box of candy. What is that? Forrest Gump, right? Most people would probably get that. Um, this is one I actually received and I actually opened. May the fence be with you. What is that? Obviously an allusion to. Star Wars, right? Most audience would probably know that. Now this is actually employing a little humor too because they threw a pun in there. This landscaping company threw in fence. That, that definitely got me, right? right. It's, pretty good. it's pretty good. Questions. So we talked a little bit about using your, your. This is the same kind of psychology. And I like questions because it doesn't require a ton of creativity. Whatever subject line you're going to use, step back and say, one, can I put the word you or your into it? Or two, and two, can I turn it into a question? If you can turn the subject line into a question, try it. 
The reason why writing a subject line as a question is really powerful, oh, how did I do that? That's really funny. That is not a question. But this is, because <laughs> um, I just updated this unique to this, to this talk today. Um, the reason why you want to employ a question is because how can that question be answered? What's the only way to answer the question? Open the email. Open the email, right? So if I'm struggling to find a way to help, the only way I can find out what context that's about, what that's about, is to open the email. Google it. And most people aren't going to stop from the marketing email and go, you know what, I'm going to go. <laughs> Numbered lists. All right. So as I said uh, a little bit earlier when I teased this, the, if there's one subject line I overuse, it's number list. Overuse it because it consistently results in high open rates for me. If you're going to employ numbered lists, you have to make sure you have numbered content. One strategy if you're drive, trying to drive people back to your site is offer people a numbered list in your subject line, give them some of the numbered items in the body of your email, and then drive them to your website to see the rest. Um, it, it's, it's like handy. But the reason why numbered lists are really are powerful because one, as I said, it infers a short amount of time. There's only seven steps, there's only three ideas, there's only five things I need to think about. I've got time for that. Yeah? Do you see a better difference between actually spelling out seven versus the numbers? You actually noticed the words on my screen. Yes. <laughs> um, strangely enough, when you write out the word, it gets a higher open rate than putting the number in. And there's a little psychology there, too, if you want to know why. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, when people are moving very, very quickly through data, and that's the definition of an inbox on a smartphone, their brain will cut off, if a sentence starts off with a, numeric, with a numerical figure, their brain will cut it off. And the eye will move to the next. If I change this to the number seven, or I change this to the number three, if they're moving really quickly, their eye will, turn, will blank that out. And it won't have the power that it had. Um, there are a couple of other pieces of psychology that play into this. Um, odd numbers get higher open rates than even numbers. And this is for the OCD folks in the house. Mm. Odd numbers psychologically, um, well, human behavior, human psychology, we prefer balance and, and uh, uh, symmetry. It's just hardwired into our brains. Well, by its nature, odd numbers are asymmetrical. They're odd. They're out of balance. Because they're out of balance, we notice it more. It works us in a small psychological way. And remember, we're trying to get people to notice it's really fast. So odd numbers get higher open rates than even. Um, Another best practice is to, don't, to not offer any more than nine. So if you're going to use numbers in your subject line, don't offer 15. Don't offer <laughs> 27. You're shooting yourself in the foot, because now it seems too complex. Um, the magic number? Three. three. Then you want to go to five or seven. So you offer five. You would offer three in the email, force people to go to the, the site to see the other two, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, some words to trigger response. So if you're trying to be trustworthy to your audience, the dep dependable, no risk expert. If you're trying to encourage them to take action, amazing, courage, happy, all powerful words. Not only are these just powerful, I mean, we've actually looked at the data. These get higher opens. Um, if you're uh, vanity, uh, hero, conquer, remarkable. And if you're covert, hidden, unlock. That's a really powerful word. That's a really powerful word. So make sure the key piece of any email marketing is your from name. Make sure your from name is recognizable to your audience. Make sure it's the name that they know you best. If you are the brand, if everyone knows you as the company, as a representative, and I think many of you may fall into that in this room, it should come from you. Or but for mid middle size company, you put sales at so and so. Well, right now we're talking about the from name, but let's talk about the email address in just one second. Okay. Um, so the from name, well, here's the thing. And here's why you want to watch out from an email coming from a person. So firstly, we'll talk about brand recognition. If you are the brand, if, if you're, literally your name is in the company name, or if you're the sole proprietor, you are the brand. You are the company. They're, you're carrying all the brand equity. But if you're not, if you're either representing a client, are you representing another, a larger company? And that larger company can be of any size. 
you want to watch out because when an email comes from a person that's not the sole proprietor or not the owner or not the brand, if an email comes from a person, the open rate will actually go up. An open rate from a person is higher than an open rate from a brand. But I didn't teach you that, did I? <sighs> the one person who's allowed to call uh, uh, with the ringtone is my wife. Um, um, but, no, I won't do that. Because um, we're, we're pretty close to the end. So, why would I tell you to have an email come from a company if a name gets a higher open rate? Because if a person starts to become the brand to the audience, if you start opening an email regularly because Matthew Montoya gives you great tips and discounts, and then Matthew Montoya leaves the company, mm -hmm. guess what happens to your open rate? You want to be careful about who you invest the brand equity in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So most often, it should be coming from the company because that, the brand isn't going to leave that. Now, email address is a whole different subject matter. So you also do need to consider what email address you use when you're sending from somebody. And you want to use the same logic. Would an audience know this email address? Does, is, is it explaining to the audience enough who this email is coming from? Generally, you want to avoid a person's personal email address. So you wouldn't want to use Matthew.Montoya at, right? That said, there's two really dangerous words that you want to avoid sending email marketing from. And they're the most common. Sales, Sales at and info at. Mm -hmm. Have it on your site. Put it on your business cards. Tell people on the phone. Don't use it in email marketing. The reason for that is that the, <laughs> this is the perfect audience to talk this about. What's the number one and number two most common email addresses found on the site? Spammers steal their email addresses often by having bots scroll the internet. So guess what email addresses they commonly get? That, so what spam filters are doing is they're um, not unfairly assuming that if it comes from one of those two, it's probably a spammer and the email's going in the spam filter. So have it come from anything other than that. But you want to generally avoid a person's name too. Um, what kind of name would you use? I'm a huge I mean, fan of. Of size company, so. I'm a huge fan of community app okay. because community community app, and this is not playing to the audience with WordPress community. Literally, <laughs> community app's a really powerful word because you can use it in all sorts of different contexts. It can come from a, a sales organization. It can come from a nonprofit, but it also elicits a relationship. And because we're trying to build a relationship with our audience and trying to give them relatable content, it's a really powerful word. Um, I would avoid also sending emails from marketing at. Marketing at generally, it, it suggests that they're going to be sold to. But it is not a spam trigger. Can the same thing be said with uh, admin at? Admin at, I, you know, that's not a spam trigger. And it's not necessarily a negative word. Um, admin at is it's a little cold. So I would completely understand with this audience, admin at would be perfectly appropriate. Mm -hmm. But you also want to think about what might motivate your audience to open an email. And an admin at may not explain enough of what you're trying to do, but it's not a spam trigger. I've even seen some that says no reply at. That's, yeah. a, yeah. that's, that's a pretty terrible one, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty terrible one. Well, I have a question on yeah. that way. Is it a best practice to, uh, I actually do appreciate it when, there, when it isn't a no reply at, when I can respond mm -hmm. and somebody does respond back. And I know one of the competitors to Constant Contact, I don't mention it, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they have a, uh, the ability to continue the conversation within the email. You can actually track it. As you go. Is, that, is that a good practice? It is, it, it's a great practice. So I mean, what we coach to is whatever email, so most programs will allow you to have two different email addresses. Mm -hmm. You can have the sender email address and the reply to email address. You just want to make sure that that reply to email address is uh, um, monitored. monitored. Yeah. Um, whatever system you're using, you want to somebody know what the number one reply to a bulk marketing email is. Unsubscribe. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and so, you want to make sure somebody's listening if somebody says that. Yep, great comment. So when, they, when they're replying to that reply email, mm -hmm. are you using the same email? It saying, depends. Oh, as long as, as, well, I can only speak personally to Constant Contact, but I'd be willing to bet all of our competitors do it. Yeah. You, you can have a different from and send. Just make sure that, that that reply, I mean, from and send, that send and that reply, just make sure that reply is monitored. Um, so if, I reply, if I'm monitoring that reply, I should send it from the receipt. Not necessarily, and in fact, I see that I see it uh, both ways often. 
Okay. I mean, it can come from community app and then reply to Matt Montoya app. I mean, because you're not worried about the same kind of, I mean, as soon as they hit reply, you're no longer worried about the perception. Um, I wouldn't okay. use no reply app, <laughs> but, okay. but the rules don't apply to the reply. Okay, so there's no, there's no little tricky. Practice, I mean, I would avoid sales and info app for the same reasons I just described from the send. Right. You're going to run into the same problems, right. but anything else is fine okay. for the reply. Any other comments, questions? No, I got one. Yeah. It may not be, but you're talking subject lines and all that. What's the best practice on sending those emails out? Can we hold that for a second? Sure. Yeah. Um, make sure you test. Don't just take my word for it. Um, test, 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 test. You don't know unless you test. Don't uh, um, keep doing the same thing over and over and over again because people will tune it out. And um, try some of those power words and, and most importantly, try some creativity. Um, don't fall into repetitive bad habits because it will ultimately not result in success for you. So the reason I wanted to hold is because now I'm here. <laughs> All right. All right. So, when you're talking about literally what time to send? Well, okay. So, I'm a company. I want to market my products. Or I give an example as a company. And don't hate for the company I'm going to say, but Victoria's Secret. Okay. Twice and sometimes three times a week, I get an email. I'm like, I get so many dang emails from people I'm tired of. At the blocker. Well, even though I'm on their list because I bought something mm -hmm. as a present years ago, I get like three or four emails a week, and it's like, come on, guys. Well, you know what you're preaching to right now is what I talked about just a moment ago, which is relevancy. Right. Right. And that's what I was thinking is there's got to be some kind of relevance or best practice. On there is. Things. There is. I mean, I'll give you that best practice in a second, but I want to okay. zero in on relevancy again because it's all about relevancy. Okay. Right. And relevancy occurs in a couple of different ways. It's not only the offer or what you're saying in the email. It's also knowing your audience and segmenting, right? right? Because right. what might be relevant to one group of people may not be relevant to another. I mean, I'll use, um, I'll use our talk about Orlando if, uh, in a second, right? Mm -hmm. If I have a list made up of all Central Florida residents and I'm trying to drive people here to West Orlando, if I shoot that off to um, uh, Winter Park or I shoot that off to Orlando itself and I'm trying to get people to come over here, many people are going to say, too far. Right. Um, so relevancy can change per recipient. But when it comes to how often you send, relevancy is the key ingredient. Because there are organizations, I'll tell you one, that I open an email from at least a couple times a week and they send me every single day. And it's my stockbroker, right? It's the company I, I hire to manage the stocks. Why is that relevant to me? Because you want to see how your stocks are doing. Because the information is fluctuating. I want their advice. That's why I hired them. It's important to me. It's relevant to me. So if I got an email every, yeah, it's it's so it's actually personalized to me. For him, Victoria's Secret isn't personalized, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's not relevant to him right. daily or right. multiple times a week. Right. Um, in the same sense, I would not accept that frequency of email from the barber across the street. That is only relevant to me at best once a month, right? So you want to think that through first, but. The typical, if we have to give generalized advice and not one-on-one -on -one consulting, generally you want to make sure you send an email at least once a month. And that's um, the reason why you want to say once a month is actually to stay relevant. So you need to have a cadence of at least one email a month just to remind people you exist, to remind them of the value proposition you bring. If you send either less than once a month, kind of staggered, or you have a true staggered send history where you're sending two emails this month, then you take two weeks or two months off, and then it's another email. That's where they're forgetting who you are, and you're either becoming white noise, or you're increasing the odds that they'll hit spam because they don't remember the relevancy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I typically coach most small businesses. Honestly, a great rhythm is once every two weeks um, because oh. you're, you're staying top of mind, um, and you're, you're, if you're doing a good job with relevancy, then they're taking action. So basically, once a week is... Too once a week's not bad. It depends on the industry and it depends on how, I mean, how well you've segmented. Okay, like one client I have, they send out once a week, but every email comes There's no that's, information. That's where you have to watch out, right? Because and you can't it's. You click onto a website to get the information. You have to scroll through it. Yep. <laughs> and that oh, be well, that, that, that could be a whole other session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But um, I'm just saying, you get a, every, you know, every week you get that, once a week. I mean, 
<laughs> mm -hmm. I see that all the time. Yeah, they're, 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 they're probably hurting themselves a lot more than they're helping themselves. I mean, the tricky thing about email marketing is that people don't add enough strategy and logic to what they're doing, especially if they're doing it on their own. And the, the reason for that is because email marketing is, can be really effective. And so they'll send out this long, crazy email, and they'll send it out too much. But because the phone rings 25 times, they're like, yay. What they don't think through is if they had thought this through with logic and best practices, that could have been 50 calls. That could have been 100 calls. Um, if, they, if they think through relevancy and they try some of these subject line ideas, that could double the impact, triple the impact. Any other questions? Yeah. Name placement. You said personalize it. Where do you put the name and is there any logic that goes back? Generally, if you put their name in first, you're going to get a higher open rate. On the very first subject yeah. line? Yeah. Um, you could actually put it in the subject line or the preheader text. Okay. Um, I would choose the subject line because it's bolded and because we're trying to capture their eye quickly. So here's the thing. People will actually read the preheader text. They'll scan the subject line. And so falling into that logic, if I said in my subject line, hope here's the 20% discount you wanted, your eye just naturally going to notice your name. And because it's bolded, you're going to notice it faster. If I put it in the preheader text because it's a little bit smaller and I didn't catch your attention with my from name, you may not notice that. Does that make sense? Um, most email clients will also, or most email, more bulk email clients will also allow you to personalize the content. That's something else you also want to think about. Another follow-up to that, or? Uh, no, I had another question yeah. to that. But uh, I always get uh, emails, even from companies I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, oh, here's your offer, 50, and then the percent will be all like, all weird, you know, uh, character, mm -hmm. stuff like that. How do you? Um, I would have to have to look at what client they're okay. using, but that said, generally you want to avoid uh, odd pieces of punctuation like that anyway. Okay. Um, fine using common things like periods, question mark, but percentage can be a little questionable. Um, all the more reason to split test it, um, but I'd have to see what they were using. I mean, that also can very, very well be dependent on the inbox they're using, what, what client they're using there, um, because it'll render in different ways. Another common thing we see um, is that if people are using, I mean, this is really common in small business, they'll keep copying emails and just editing one piece of it. And because HTML can actually pile up, that could be what's causing that. Another question? I've answered every potential question. I'm just going to start drinking at every gig I have now. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you very much. That is my Twitter handle and my LinkedIn.